Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Jeremy Hafner, Chancellor at the University of Denver. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to a webinar that will answer many of your questions regarding the fall opening of our University of Denver in fall of 2020. We have a lot to cover. Um, so I'm gonna keep my opening remarks very, very brief, um, but I know that this will not be the last webinar that we'll do for continuing and new students. Because in fact, um, as the days and weeks go on, we are solidifying our plans and details for how we're gonna open up in the fall. And we will wanna share with you all on a continual basis. This is uh, the challenges of the technology age that we are living in here. So thank you for your patience. As I said, um, as we develop more plans and details, we will be wanting to share with you uh, in future town halls and webinars, just like this one. So please stay tuned for this. Now, first, I want to really underscore what we hope that you are all are experiencing. We hope that you are healthy and staying safe. I can't tell you how extremely stressful these times are. And now it's not just about the coronavirus that's keeping us up at night. The protests that we're seeing in the streets of Denver and across the country are tremendously adding to the anxiety and the injustices that we all feel. What I can say to you, all of you in the audience though, is that we are making these necessary decisions to navigate through the coronavirus through a very strong lens of equity and fairness. And by sharing our decisions and thought processes as we do today, we hope that you will feel a little bit more comfortable uh, with, the, with the unknown that still faces us. Now, we will be welcoming back our students on campus in the fall so that they can live and learn together in a healthy way and that they can build lifelong friendships that is natural in a residential college experience. And this is my commitment and this is my expectation that students will in fact have a meaningful face-to-face -face experience, uh, the kind that they expect from the University of Denver. Now it will be different because of the necessary protocols that we have to put in place. And you'll learn more about what that differences are. But we are so happy to be welcoming you back in the fall. Now, if you saw my messages from uh, the last several weeks, but especially the message last Friday, you know that we're doing careful planning in every area of the university, but especially regarding housing, course delivery, and how to provide support for our students in the classroom, outside the classroom, and especially how we're going to accommodate the social interaction, which is so important to our students. So we've received some questions in advance, um, and we're going to share those, and we're going to start uh, having some explanations from a, a team of experts that we have here at the University of Denver. But we also encourage you to send in questions through our Q&A uh, dialog box that uh, is available at the bottom of your Zoom window there. There are also many answers uh, that are posted on our websites and you're seeing some of these uh, links in the chat box of the Zoom window as well. And we'll help you navigate to those appropriate answers along the way. Now you'll need to cut and paste, by the way, those links into your browser so that you'll have access to them as well. So let's get right to our panelists and then get started with some questions. So I'm really pleased to uh, start with uh, Kareen Lengsfeld. She's the Interim Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor here at the University of Denver. Uh, Kareen does all things academic, uh, is the chair of our Fall Logistics Task Force. So she knows quite a bit about what will happen in the academic space in the fall. She's a deeply respected teacher uh, researcher and administrator. She's been here for over 20 years, so she deeply knows the DU community. Nikki Latino, please wave so that people know um, who I'm introducing there. Nikki is the Interim Vice Chancellor for Campus Life and Inclusive Excellence. 
She earned her master's and doctorate degrees at the University of Denver, so she's a great alum for us. Her PhD is in fact in higher education teaching and learning with specialties in inclusive leadership and inclusive excellence. She's taught at, U at the University of Denver, at, both at the graduate level and at the undergraduate level and in our pioneer leadership program. And she currently serves as a graduate student research committee on several different committees. Carrie Panikbar is the uh, executive director of community and residential education. She oversees housing, residential education, student engagement, our new community commons, yay, that will open up in next year, and our programs around inclusion and equity education. Michael Lafar is the executive director of our health and counseling center and interim associate vice chancellor for campus life and inclusive excellence. He is a clinical psychologist and he also teaches in our Mortgage College of Education and the Graduate School of Professional Psychology. John Goodwagen is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Financial Aid. John has been helping students and families with financial aid and enrollment for more than 30 years, and we're so lucky to have him. He's been with us since 2015. And finally, Yudio Rajurhuri is the Vice Provost for Internationalization here at the University of Denver. UDL has been at DU for just about six months. And so he's been under the gun to reorganize study abroad, advise our international students through the disruption they're experiencing. And beyond study abroad, UDL's role is to ensure that global education is infused in every student's DU experience. So UDL, it's great to have you part of the DU family. All right, so that's our great panelists here. Uh, they come from all different uh, corners of the university that are engaged with students. So let's dive in because I know you have so many questions out there. And I'm gonna start with housing and residential experiences. So this is for Nikki and Carrie. What I would love you to do is tell, us, tell the audience a little bit about what housing will look like on campus in the fall. Uh, what's guaranteed for sophomores? How can third and fourth year students apply for housing? What about roommates? And you know, if, they, if they're in singles, can they be at least close to roommates and so forth? So talk to us a little bit about the housing situation in the fall of 2020. Thank you, Chancellor. And I'm, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you today. I'll start it off and then Carrie will pick up as well. Our housing options for the fall are going to be a mix of single and doubles. And we will provide housing to as many of our second year students as possible on campus. And we are also exploring options off campus to help secure the housing. And with roommates, we will do our best for students who've selected roommates and maybe living in a single to have them either on the same floor or at least in the very same building. Carrie, would you like to add some pieces about our third and fourth year? Yeah, so third and fourth year students have already, prior to, to our life of COVID, um, had an opportunity uh, to, to look at their housing options. And so we were able to go through um, that process with our third and fourth years. If you're still looking for housing, you are more than welcome to still fill out a housing application. Um, and we will work with you, but we also have a great off-campus housing resource uh, that you will also be able to use um, and we can help you with as well. So please, if you, uh, and again, if you would like to be out of your housing contract, you can email the housing department as well um, and we will take care of you in that. Terrific, thank you. And this won't be the last time we'll touch on housing. So there'll be a lot more questions. I'm seeing them already pop in the Q&A, so we'll circle back to that. But let's turn to Dr. Lengsfeld. Um, Dr. Lengsfeld, you know, some questions that have already come up to us is why have, why have finals been moved to after Thanksgiving? Tell us the rationale behind that. Um, what can be expected in terms of the types of classes? Um, what about grading, the, the pass plus, the pass no fail, that was implemented in the spring quarter and now extended in the summer. Will that go into the fall? So help the, the participants here in the audience a little bit understand what they can expect from their classroom uh, sure. experience. Let me start with the finals. <clears throat> so we went to online finals uh, 
because we know, especially in the fall, that there is a likelihood of the resurgence of the virus during cold and flu season. <coughs> For us on campus, that happens when, of course, our students are working late and studying hard for finals, and so it crops up at that moment. What we're trying to do by providing a reading week and then delaying the finals by one week <coughs> is to allow students to be able to, um, if needed, uh, move back home, get settled, have Thanksgiving, and then take their final in a much quieter and better place. We saw this spring quarter, or winter quarter, when we put finals online and we were moving students out of the dorm, the stress that this inflicted on our students. Um, it, it wasn't a great situation. And we know that no one really particularly liked having to do those simultaneously. So we're trying to be proactive and think ahead, give some breathing room and some space more than 60% of our students live out of state. That's where their house is. And so just giving us a little bit more time for students to do what they need to do to get home and then get ready and prepared for finals. I think this will um, make many people happy and it'll annoy other people. But I, I do think this was the smartest thing we could do in a time where there's great uncertainty to prepare for a most probable scenario. Now, in terms of modalities for how teaching would happen for each class, we're very committed in making sure that the modality type of the class is known so that uh, brand new students who are registering, they will know the modality of the class that they're registering for during their decision making. We also are very committed to allowing students to know this modality for our continuing students early enough so that they may alter, if they would like, their course schedule a little bit well before the quarter begins um, early in the summer. Right now, we're working really hard to identify all classes into sort of three priorities. One priority is priority on campus, in-face, person-to-person, and those are for high-impact courses defined by the American, uh, American Association of Colleges and Universities who have determined that these classes have a, the greatest impact on student success. Those are the ones we wanna make sure at the graduate and undergraduate level are in person and face-to-face. -face. Because of social distancing, we know that those requirements will force a number of courses to have to be online. That we do not have the facilities or the number of rooms to support really large courses as face-to-face. So a second category is to really identify which courses need to be online regardless. That is just unlikely that we will be able to do them in person. The third category is a category that we'd like to call hybrid, a class that there may be a flipped classroom where there's some asynchronous online components and some discussion face-to-face -face components. This really gives us the flexibility that students can have some success but they don't have schedule con conflicts where we don't have to have all the learning happen all the time face to face. We hope to be able to put those three different types of modalities out into the course registration so students can choose their courses ahead of time knowing the modality that they'll live in and that they can choose the best type for them. Some students may want all online and some students may want a preponderance of face to face. Others, because of their learning styles, may in fact like these hybrid courses and high flex courses more than either of those other two. We're working really hard and we're hoping in the next two weeks to be able to um, have those lists and begin to be uh, um, compiling that into the larger registration system. It is a quick turnaround and it will take us a little bit of time. And we hope that everybody recognizes and affords us some flexibility to get this done right. Jeremy, can you re repeat the third question? I think I only answered the first two. Grading, I got it. Grading. Uh, yeah. The university for um, lots of reasons for equity issues uh, went to a modified pass non-pass system where there was a pass plus or a high pass 
pass and no pass for the spring quarter because of our rapid flip and the movement home, the isolation, uh, the complete frustration um, and uncertainty of everyone to provide an out, to provide a release of tension. We decided to continue that into the summer by vote of the Faculty Senate. I do not know exactly how it will work in the fall, but I do know that we have policies that have and will be passed that are part of a much greater uh, grade reform package that we put forward. One of those is uh, a grade replacement policy that we hope to finalize and put in place so that if students experienced hardship, uh, could not perform well in one class as well as they normally could, they could retake the course without GPA penalty. We've also tried to put in other structures through CLE, Campus Life and Inclusive Excellence, to really be thoughtful about how students uh, can react and, and withdraw. So if they see a problem or experience a problem, they are supported through that. The grade policy is only one of many pieces of the grade reform that we tried to push through as a result of the pandemic. All those other pieces are institutionalized and put into place. It is just the grade alternative grading scheme that we will bring to the faculty like we did in the last two quarters for deliberation prior to the quarter. And we will announce it, but it probably needs to be determined after we know exactly how the fall quarter is going to fall out, what the modalities will be, how the courses will play out, what will the extended days look like, what will the extended times look like. We wanna be able to make sure that we're making those decisions with input from students after they have all the data to understand how that fall will work. Moreover, how the entire year will likely play out. If we pivot rapidly, I am because of resurgence to an online, I'm quite confident that the faculty will vote yet again for a modified grading scheme as we did in the spring. Jeremy. Yeah, thank you, Corrine. I'm gonna stay on you, so uh, don't relax too much. <laughs> there was a couple of questions that I thought we would piggyback on what you just said. There's um, several, several students that are asking um, if they've already registered for classes, what can they expect given the fact that we're gonna to have to make some of these changes to classes and put them in different buckets? So can you help students appreciate a little bit about what, uh, what's next in store for their registration project? Well, I really encourage students to register and get their calendar because it's a way of determining what you need. So we know what are the needed classes for the fall, right? It's a, the strongest messaging students can convey to us in this moment. So we are not making assumptions about the courses that people need, want, or desire. As we make decisions, of course, we will find ways to communicate with students to indicate if they're the modality of their class and what that is so that they know. Right right now, there is no modality listed because of course, in the pre-COVID, everything was assumed to be face-to-face. -face. So we will be communicating that. If sections need to be made smaller or um, we need to create more sex sections to accommodate wait lists because we would like to make sure that students are getting the courses they need, we will be pushing out that information for students. I expect there, everyone will have some minor change that they will need to deal with in their course scheduling, but they will be given enough head time notice in later uh, mid, mid July so that they can make the appropriate changes. I want people to be fully informed but I want students to register so that we're fully informed about what's needed and required. And in that, we will be able to find the best solution. If the course times have to change because of de-densification, we'll also make sure that we're communicating that to people, right? So we'll be working through this and trying to minimize the impact, um, but also recognizing that there's going to be a fraction of all classes that are affected 
I think the least problematic is that the room assignment for the class will change. I think that's all going to go different. So don't print out your schedule. The rooms are not the same. Uh, the more of the question is, is do we have to put it at a different time or in a different modality? And we're going to try to minimize as much as we can the changes as possible, but we understand that there will be just because of the de-densification requirements in place and likely in place as fall starts. Communication's the key. We're not going to communicate until we have knowns because we don't want to create chaos. So we really want that when we finally do communicate that you have the full information and that we have answers to your questions and that we're prepared with advisors to help you work through those processes together as a team, fully in support of all your needs. That includes students that are in LEP and disability services, those that may uh, need other uh, special uh, situations like athletes. We're very committed to students that will be graduating that we're on time for graduation, and we are 100% committed in making that happen. Those are the things that we'll be working with students side by side as we walk through to prepare for the fall. Students are not alone, and we are here to help whatever it takes. And I'll simply add that uh, from, from my perch and my expectation of the student experience, uh, while there will be these modalities, we are really committed to making sure that all students have a meaningful face-to-face -face experience, both inside and outside the classroom, so that you can expect a mixture of these different kinds of classes and, and that that will be uh, what our commitment is in, in that regard for you. Um, one last question, Kareen, and then I'm gonna, I, I'll stop picking on you and it's a, it's a quick one. Will, this is from a first year student or a first year student parent, Will advisors reach out to first year students prior to registration in July? We are overwhelmed with the thought of choosing classes as a freshman. So, I, so first year students um, has summer registration and there are modules to help train students, but there are also webinars and, and uh, opportunities for advising. Um, I think we'll be doing large reach out and then giving people the times and the places and the resources for them to connect. However, if students are struggling, right, we're going to want you to be proactive to reach out to us. It's hard sometimes at a uh, distance to know um, uh, who is struggling. And so it's important to feel people feel empowered uh, if they have questions that they're reaching out and letting us know. They won't be alone. So we may reach out not only to them, but a broader group of people, because of course their questions are likely shared by a, a silent group of people that are standing right beside them. So we have a lot of different methodologies that will help students figure out how to register. Um, some majors are easier because it's these classes and that's what you do. And some majors are more exploratory like undeclared. And we're gonna work through all of those and there's lots of resources that are coming on tap before the registration occurs and begins. Thank you, Corrine. Okay, I'm gonna to turn uh, to UDO uh, and the study abroad questions. UDO, you know that we have um, a number of juniors that are disappointed that they are not realizing their study abroad trips in the fall quarter. Um, of course, we made the decision to cancel for health and safety reasons. That was very, very clear. But they're asking questions such as, will students who are unable to go in the fall, will they receive priority for next year's applications? Um, and what about for seniors um, who uh, had study abroad canceled for them as juniors? What, what can you tell about uh, how we're going to handle study abroad for our, our juniors this year? Great question, Jeremy. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the attendees here. Um, we are committed to internationalization at DU and to education abroad. Uh, the world right now is in a state where it is not safe for our students to travel. Um, infrastructure capacity is abroad. Many programs are canceled. And you know the situation in various countries are very different and not safe for them to be there. But we are committed to providing study abroad opportunities for them. So we are working hard with the Office of International Education team and students who were planning to go in the fall, 
will definitely have opportunities to go in the winter or spring or even next fall if that is how they choose. Our team is doing outreach and will continue to do this outreach throughout the summer to look at the options that they are choosing, where they want to go. And in many cases, if the opportunities are safe, the programs that they were seeking, they are available and the logistics work, we will support and we are committed to taking them and giving them a study abroad experience. Um, I, I firmly believe that education abroad and, and the discovery of place eventually leads to a self-discovery and their broader internationalization and global citizenship and all of that. And so our office will continue to provide in the interim, we'll continue with our intercultural courses on INTZ 2501, uh, other programming and all those things during the fall so that internationalization as a whole is not lost. But of course, we will, as soon as education abroad opportunities are available, uh, work with the students to ensure that they are provided those. Thank you. Thank you, Udil. I'm sure there will be additional questions, so we'll circle back to you. I'm gonna to turn to, um, to John Goodbogan now. Um, John is our Director of Financial Aid. Uh, as I mentioned, he's got years of experience. So here's a couple of questions, John, for you. Um, our situation has changed, um, and this is true for so many of our, our families out there. And we're concerned that our financial aid award is no longer enough. What should, what should they do? What do you advise our, our students who are still pressed for financial aid? Okay, great, thank you. Um, you know, we're very concerned about families uh, and their financial situations. So um, what, we'd, what we'd first suggest is uh, go to our appeals page at the financial aid website uh, there's a special circumstances form there and provide us some information. So what our attempt to do here is to, is to help understand your situation and also to recognize that given the nature of this pandemic and the economic crisis, you may not actually have all the things in place that you might normally have in a typical appeal. So we also want to say, do the best you can in giving us the, the best information. I often say we need two things, the story and the numbers. Here's the story of what happened to me. And here are the numbers in terms of here's how this is impacting us. Um, then we have a bunch of really amazing and great dedicated financial aid advisors who are working very hard to understand your situation and look at the resources that we have and match that with your needs so that we can um, help you through this process also. Great, John, thank you. Um, one more question for you though, John. Um, here's a rising second year student and uh, they're thinking of opting to live off campus. What about their housing grant? Will they lose it? Yeah, very common question. And uh, here's the answer. If you had, uh, if you're a rising second year student and you had a housing contract, you had, you had asked, you had put yourself in, in the process to get housing, um, but now you've, you've taken advantage or thinking of taking advantage of the option to get out of that contract that, that uh, my colleagues here in, in housing have offered you, you'll be able to keep that residence hall grant. And obviously only, not everybody has a residence hall grant, but many, many students have a residence hall grant. And if you have that and you're a rising second year student and you opted out of that contract that you had, you're able to keep it for, for, the, for the year. Awesome. Thank you, John. All right, um, I'm gonna go to Michael Lafar, who is our uh, director of our health counseling center um, and associate vice chancellor for in, uh, campus life and inclusive excellence. Um, Michael and I have been working very diligently with a number of others uh, to really come up with plans on how do we augment healthcare, how do we look at testing, um, how do we make sure that we're really monitoring the coronavirus. That work is still in progress, um, but the questions that we're um, getting here, Michael, is um, will we be testing everyone on campus, students, faculty, and staff? And what will you do when someone tests positive? How will you quarantine if all rooms are on campus are taken? And again, maybe we, we don't have all the answers, but uh, I think you can pick and choose some of those uh, questions that we can answer well. Great, thank you, Chancellor. You know, um, the, what we're coming to learn is that the, 
the virus surprises us in um, from a week to week basis. What we knew a month ago has changed in a lot of ways from what we know today. So we're going to continue to monitor. We've got robust relationships with um, the department. Department of Public Health with uh, local hospitals. So we're gonna continue our relationships with these experts to ensure that our, as you know, we have a, um, a robust and, and wonderful primary health care facility here on campus available to all graduate and undergraduate students. So our physicians and medical team there is consulting with uh, these experts uh, on a weekly basis. We are um, in regular contact with um, public health experts from across the country. So we're going to continue to stay uh, on top of what are the new developments, and we are going to modify that plan. The reason why we haven't decided, you know, a common question is, will you do mass testing? We haven't, uh, you know, we, we looked at some of the, um, the testing that we thought was going to be very accurate a month ago and have learned it's not. So we're going to ensure that what we put in place is scientifically based, and um, what is indicated to protect our community. We're gonna keep our, our doctors and nurses in, um, uh, in, in touch with all of the experts. So we're gonna to continue to develop that dynamic plan. We will put uh, aside one residence hall for folks who get sick so that we can care for them and monitor them in a way uh, to be sure that they are they're getting the care that they need. So um, we'll continue to develop this plan throughout the, throughout the summer and when we have the best information available to us, we will let the community know. At this point, it's study, 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 develop uh, contingency plans because we want to take care of this community. Thank you, Michael. All right, I'm going to circle back to housing because that um, has been one where it has generated lots and lots of questions. And so I'm going to go right to, to carry on, on these two. It, and two of these questions are really interesting because um, they reflect the decision-making process of why we chose the housing plan that we did. So one of the questions is, are you concerned that with limited resources for on-campus housing, students will cram into off-campus housing and social distancing will be lost anyway? So that's one uh, end of the spectrum. The other one is, I think I read that housing will be targeted at 77% capacity. How is that reduction determined and is that enough? for distancing. So you can, both of those questions were, re, were reflected in our decision making process. If we didn't provide enough housing, we knew that students uh, were going to live off campus and we couldn't control the physical distancing, nor could we control the cleaning that we think is necessary to navigate the coronavirus. On the other hand, we did want to make sure that the housing on campus was sufficiently safe for our students. So Carrie, you want to um, just kind of reflect a little bit more about um, how you're looking at protecting our students both on campus and off campus? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I think that this is one of the um, dynamic pieces of how we're going to be housing our students. So, so I'll try to tackle that first one for uh, a bit. So students who are moving off campus and cramming into these spaces, we would definitely not encourage that. Um, there is quite a bit of property around the institution right now. Um, that can make that happen where you're not having to do that. So we also plan to do a, a great deal of education around what social distancing is and how to be safe in your own home um, for the students who were going to live with us so that you have the exact same materials that we're giving to everybody um, in the cleaning. Of course, we can't um, control if you choose to live with 10 people in a three bedroom house. So uh, we would not um, suggest that, but that will be up for um, you all to decide to do. Um, so that's sort of the one piece of this is in terms of the 77% um, we have a, a, a pretty vast housing portfolio here on campus and um, our rooms are configured all, all differently. So we have rooms that were really created just to be a single space. They're smaller in size. They're not the size of doubles um, or in our apartment style properties as well. And so because of the vastness of our property and what we have in terms of offerings, what we did was we were able to look at all of the different pieces and all of the different buildings and what each of those places offered and provide students with the safest experience living in those spaces that we had to offer. And so that's how we decided upon our housing portfolio and how we were going to house students was we looked at this, the size of the space of the room, uh, the, the bathroom situation that they were going to have, 
um, and then the overall experience in that building um, in the high touch areas. Thank you, Carrie. And one other question, Carrie. Um, we have a number of students that belong to fraternities and sororities. Mm -hmm. uh, are they going to be able to live in those houses that we have on, on our, our campus or close to our campus? Yeah, so this is a really, this is a, this is an excellent question and one that I'm going to also really encourage you to talk to your um, chapter leadership about as well. So if you belong to an FSL community, um, there is a, DU owns and operates some of those properties while other properties are not owned and operated by DU. And so the, the properties that are owned, by, owned and operated by DU, um, we're going to encourage them to follow the same things that we're doing on campus. However, we've not made you know, specific details about um, what their house and their occupancy are. So those are um, the fraternities ZBT and LCA and sororities for DZ and Tri-Deltas. Those are the ones that the university um, has more say in, um, in terms of lease and, and students living into those um, houses. If you belong to um, a fraternity or sorority that is not one of the ones that I just mentioned, those are going to be um, contracts that you have signed solely with that um, chapter. And so you'll really need to work with that chapter, your housing corps and your chapter president on what your stipulations are and what your contracts that you signed with them. For those of you who are living in the four that I just mentioned, um, we're still encouraging you to speak with your chapter leadership. Uh, one of the questions that has come up was, uh, I, I was going to be a, I'm a fraternity member in one of the fraternity houses and I wanna be out of my um, two year live on contract to go live at home. If you have your membership in your agreement with the fraternity, if you've already signed your membership with them, uh, you'll need to contact them to make sure that you are still in compliance with what you've agreed to in terms of your fraternity. Oftentimes they have a stipulation in there that you have to live in the house. Um, and so you'll need to work with those chapter presidents and the housing corps to make sure that you're still in line uh, with meeting all of your requirements. Thank you, Carrie. Now, one uh, other question on housing, hot off the presses here. Um, let's see, when, house, when the housing contract was waived, so was the meal plan option. What options will second year students off campus have for meals? That's an excellent question. We, you, they can have any options that they would like. So the housing contract for the first and second year students certainly ties you. If you live on, if you're first and second year student, you also need to have a meal plan with us. If you opt to live off campus and, and take, take yourself out of the housing um, pool with the waiver, um, that means that you don't have to have a, a meal plan on campus. However, you can have a meal plan. You can still choose to, from any of our meal plans that we offer. And we also have a commuter meal plan that you're also welcome to choose from. So please still sign up for a meal plan. There is no stipulations around any student not having a meal plan. We can offer that to anybody. Terrific. Thank you, Carrie. Um, back to Kareen here. There's some questions still on schedules and when will people know? So one, one statement question is, I think I may have missed the answers to this question. What is the anticipated date to have the information in place so the students know what their schedules will look like? For those that work or have other obligations outside of schools, it will be critical to have this information as far in advance as possible. My hope is, is that we would have specifics for people uh, by July 15th or before, you know, if I'm so lucky, uh, that would be my, my hope. July 15th, thank you. And, and that coincides, by the way, with a, a longstanding commitment that we've had at the university that July 15th was a date by which we would really have a lot of more information and details that we will present. It may not be complete at that point in time, but it will just give the sense of to the community that um, all the richness of what the experience will be like for our students in that regard. So not just on the registration process as well. All right, let's see. Um, let's see, that, that's, a, uh, that's a question I think we've answered. Let me go to um, uh, the, two questions here on 
deferring coming to campus here. So one question is, and I guess Corrine, you, you and I will need to tag team this one. Um, can my child sit out uh, the fall and come back in the spring? Is there negative consequences other than delay of graduation? And related to that, what are your deferral policies for first year students considering a gap year? That's, that's gonna be a question for John in admissions a little bit more. So uh, Kareem, why don't you tackle the question, can my, can my students sit out of the fall and come back in the spring? And then John uh, will ask the question about uh, the gap year. So we have um, quite nice, like, quite nice uh, deferral policies here. Um, people can wait till um, very long before making those decisions. Uh, the problems I see and I, I worry about is that some majors lend themselves better to, uh, than others to not coming for one quarter. Uh, many of our programs have uh, a very specific sequence of courses and because of our size and um, sort of uh, our ability to connect faculty with students, we don't actually offer every class every term. And so you could easily get at a sequence by not uh, attending in a particular term and then holding off to start up again in another term. So I really encourage people to understand their major requirements before ever making the, entering into that discussion and maybe having a conversation with their advisor. Um, I do think though that it's also um, advisable sometimes for people to take time off and the university allows students to defer or um, to take a leave of absence, but it's important to file the paperwork so that we can keep track of you and enter you at the right time. I also think that um, there are reasons why having a continuous education, it leads better to student success and outcomes and that we know when um, there's a little bit more just, just jointedness in a program. Uh, it doesn't always work out the best for the student in the long haul, although everything had the best intentions up front. And we see this in students that take leaves of absences, that it's very hard to restart. I think each and individual, every case is individual and the family and the student need to really sit down and weigh their pros and cons and their options. Looking at that particular student's circumstances, looking at that particular student's degree program, that particular student's placement in what year they're at, um, and really get a, a, a holistic determination of their own situation and one in which they're looking at the perspective from all sides before they decide uh, how they want to proceed. I would hope every student would be thoughtful um, and careful in what they do. So uh, that was a fairly complete answer. Uh, John, though, in the admission process, sometimes students take a gap year and uh, the question is, what are the deferral policies for first year students considering a gap year? Um, so could you just, whatever, whatever Corrine added, maybe add some uh, additional context for that? Uh, yeah, uh, gap years have always been a, a, a great option for some students and the admission page has a form on it that we encourage students to fill out to, to indicate their interest in taking a gap year. And then it's really reviewed on a case by case basis. Uh, so certainly we're looking carefully at that this year. Also, if a student has a merit award, the merit award continues once they return after that gap year. And if you have uh, an additional need based award, then of course we're asking for a new financial aid application that year. But what we'd say is go to the admission page, fill out the, the gap year request form, and the admission office will review that. Great. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to uh, put out a question here, and it, I'm going to give a, a bit of an answer, but it's going to include several of you, because it's a, it's a really good question, and it's a multi-part kind of question, if you will. Um, and the question starts off, I'm sure you've wrestled with all the ethics around the decision to reopen. Could you take us through the thought processes? How, for example, do you plan to keep the dorms safe? Do you really think it's possible for students to sustain social distancing? Do you have quarantine housing? We've answered that one. And will students quarantine in their rooms? How will you keep students and faculty and staff who are at great risk safe? How do you have a rate of infection that would cause you to close again? So it's a great question. 
uh, one that we are uh, we continue to grapple with, and we will um, develop, I think, further kind of healthcare plans around this. But there's some cleaning questions in there. There's some student engagement questions. So I'm going to um, first tackle the the part about how we came to make the decision to reopen. This was um, a very significant decision for the university to make, as you can kind of imagine. And there were really there were really um, five principles at play. Number one, number one top of the list is what's the health and safety of our community members and could we ensure that? But number two was the educational experience of the University of Denver. Um, we know that I think we did a wonderful job at pivoting online and I know the faculty were extremely dedicated to the online learning uh, outcomes of our students but we also know that our students experience things outside the classroom. And so we really want to bring that essence back to uh, our decision making. And so that educational experience was a part of it. We knew that uh, the, the, the course of the institution was important in that um, ethics uh, and equity and fairness was another part. And that drove lots of different decisions in that regard. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were accessible and that's, of course, one of the um, principles we put into play. And then, of course, um, our faculty and staff, and we took their needs and um, livelihood into consideration in all of those. And uh, looking at where we were at the time, we did feel and continue to feel that the coronavirus is manageable for the university based on the information that we have today with increased testing and a very thorough healthcare plan that we're going to develop over the next couple of months. So uh, I think we feel very confident that this is the right decision for both our students, uh, for our community members writ large, um, and of course the, the university. Now, obviously um, we're gonna take into account um, individuals who are at high risk and we're going to make sure that uh, they are uh, protected and safe and healthy in all of this. Uh, it goes not just for students, but for our faculty and staff. Uh, they have articulated not only our, that they may be at, at risk, but uh, they may be caring for someone in their family at high risk. So we have to take those considerations in mind. I'm gonna turn now to this notion of student experience. I'm gonna turn to Nikki here to chime in a little bit about this. So the question is a really good one. How can we expect our students um, to really uh, reflect the needs of the protocols of the social and physical distancing that we're doing here. What are we gonna put in place to not only make sure that that happens, um, but also to make sure that there are reasonable experiences that our students are gonna have for that face-to-face -face, um, experience at the university. So Nikki, do you wanna start us off and see where we go with that? Yes, thank you, Chancellor. It's a very important question and this is new learning and experience and behavior for all of us. And so as we train our students on how do you physical, physically distance and still stay socially connected, we're taking an educational approach. We're going to do some, on, some orientation and training around social norming and education and peer leaders are involved with helping us with us with this as well so that we can really hit home our shared responsibility for not only our health and safety, but the health and safety of peers and the DU community because at DU, we look out for one another and that's a shared responsibility. So we will have that educational campaign. We'll all also be putting in place guiding behaviors that we will again train our students on so that they are clear on the expectations of their responsibility for self and the community. And then I've been so impressed with our programmers this quarter who quickly pivoted to create pathways of community for our students. And that was our student leadership. That was our leadership within CLE and every single department as part of our programming council that transcended divisions with athletics and recreation and international student and scholar services and academic colleges. So as we continue to think about how we safely do face-to-face -face programming in the residence hall connected to the chancellor's four dimensional student strategic visioning. It's gonna be a mix of workshops and residential connections and student engagement programming and being creative about what we can be doing 
as we keep the safety and health of our students at the forefront. But it's gonna take all of us and we've started outlining that and that will be ramping up in the next few weeks. And we hope to share more of that in the coming weeks about what our plan is. And Nikki, what about the honor code? Because I think there's been conversations about um, making modifications to that so that the students really know this is serious stuff um, and we're gonna take it serious. Can you address Absolutely. that? Yes, absolutely, Chancellor. Uh, we are going to be putting COVID-specific policies together. And for the accountability part for the students, again, we'll be very explicit on that. And any violation of that will be held accountable through the honor code with non-compliance to the policy. So we will have specific COVID policies connected to the honor code and what we expect of our students and the accountability pieces through the conduct process if those are not followed. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go back to Corrine here. Corrine, this is not about the academics um, per se, but it's about cleaning because you've played a kind of integral role in the reopening of the campus and uh, you've been working across divisions to ensure not only safety as we reopen, but um, the cleanliness. Uh, and of course that all leads into the health and safety of our students, faculty and staff. So could you address that? Sure. I think uh, the most important thing as we've begun to reopen is, is that we're not reopening in fall. We're reopening a little bit right now and have been for weeks and we'll be continuing to grow that over the months ahead so that we're prepared for fall, that we uh, have refined our protocols. Uh, we understand robust ways to do tracking, tracing, which are already going on on campus with our um, employees that are at work. So it is a gradual buildup to be ready for fall, which includes not only disinfectant protocols and cleaning protocols that keeps common areas and high touch places cleaned twice a day, but bathrooms with high cleaning, understanding how we need to remove or, or um, with signage, make sure that people aren't sitting closer than six feet apart, that we're not all trying to go through the same entry door and exit door, that you have one way in, one way out to de-densify, to know that, our, um, that everybody must be wearing the right equipment, masks at the moment is required, um, if you're cleaning, you need to have gloves. Uh, there are multiple layers on how you create protection. It is not one, it is the multi-layered piece. Cleaning is one, building modifications, uh, social distancing and protective equipment, tracking, tracing, testing. Um, but all, all those things sum together, including training before you come, signage to remind you of best practices, all add up to a safe environment. At all times, we're trying to keep what we're doing within the CDC guidance of risks at moderate, which is sort of your normal everyday life, and to keep everything away from anything above that. Our housing, in fact, we selected a per particular style of housing, of doing one person per room in places of shared bathrooms, and then allowing doubles to occur when you had family style suites. Uh, this was recommended to us as a good way to be of moderate risk. We'll have health professionals with the HCC that can do testing for students. We'll have tele mental health services available because we know this is stressful. But we'll also have, like Nikki said, conduct and employee situations that enforce compliance um, when it is not followed voluntarily. Um, so there is a number of different things that all add up to the successful recipe of a place that will create um, an, an excellent, healthy place to work that is married with a response of when there's a positive. When there's a positive, we have clear policies that we've already been using up to this point, where there is immediate within hours, uh, a decision on if in fact the person that was positive was in a space when and for how long, with whom, notify them, close that area, clean it, make it safe, follow all our guidelines and policies, 
you can actually see these. They're mostly public facing on our COVID uh, website. If you would like to look at our reopening plan, we're adding to it every day um, with new guidances for open shared locations compared to closed classrooms as building ventilation protocols. It is a very deep and rich response in order to keep our faculty, staff and students safe, not just in the fall, but starting today and throughout the months to come so that we're practiced and ready for how fall will happen. Okay, we are almost at the end of the hour. So there is one more elephant in the room. Uh, the question is, what about masks? And will students be required to wear masks on campus? Will the campus provide masks for our students, faculty and staff? Um, Currently, our protocols at, that Corrine had just mentioned and walked us through do require all personnel on the campus to wear masks. Um, we are at a phase two of the reopening process. And quite frankly, we, we don't, and these are guidelines that are coming down both from the state and the city of Denver, as well as from uh, great guidance from our, the public health officials. Uh, we do know that masks um, do slow and flatten the curve, especially when worn appropriately. Uh, they prevent other people from um, getting infected um, if you happen to be asymptomatic, for example. So they play a very important role for the safety and well being of our community members. I think it's fair to expect that students, faculty, and staff will be needing to wear masks while on campus. Um, and so the university is prepared to um, provide masks for our students as they come on board. We are making sure that they are, of course, appropriately branded for the DU logo. So here is one in particular that we're considering and we hope to have other varieties as well. Should these be necessary, these will be distributed to our students, faculty and staff. Um, Corrine, do you want to add anything else about the mask situation before I leave that? Sure. I just think it's highly likely that that guidance from the governor will remain in place uh, as we enter the fall quarter. And that um, I think that there is a lot of people that prefer their own masks because of their personal style, comfort, and that we are um, always open to making sure that the masks are worn and that people feel comfortable with them. And so we won't be forcing a product on anyone. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. That's an important one. Masks are very personal in choice. All right, well, I wanna first of all, thank everyone for joining us today. I especially wanna thank our panelists who have such great information for us all to have um, and the staff that work behind to try to answer some of the questions. There were many, many, many questions. And what we're going to do, of course, is try to answer as many of those that we can over the course of the next several weeks. We do expect to have lots more information and we will pro be providing that information through a, a variety of different channels, social media, our website, and of course, more of these town hall meetings and webinars. So please look for more information about that. Uh, and again, I thank you so much for your active participation with the, um, with the questions that, that you've had. This town hall was recorded and will be posted online so that you may, um, circle back to it or you may share it with other students and other friends uh, and other families as well. Um, I think it's safe to say that we are excited to have our students back on campus in the fall in a safe and healthy manner that we will, we will work so diligently to provide. I think uh, there will be additional kinds of services that uh, we're looking into that will assure the confidence that we all have that this will be a very, very safe campus and still will have that wonderful University of Denver educational experience. We've learned a lot so far. Everything is changing. We'll continue to learn. That's the DU way. And we will be sharing that information as we do. So please stay tuned for more of these webinars, for uh, more of this information that will flow. And I so thank you for not only joining us today, but being part of the University of Denver family. Thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of your day, bye-bye.